we can uh, go to Romans in chapter number two. Thanks for Junior for filling in for me last week. I well, might have been glad to get a break from you for a few minutes. So Romans chapter 2, we'll look at verse 11, Lord, we're on the day. As far as I know, we're really not related to anyone here, but me and Sister Diane do come very close to <laughs> We share some cousins, but from different sides of the tree. <laughs> so it's Romans chapter 2, verse number 11. We'll take our text from here. If you recall from a couple weeks back, we looked at a the judgment of God, how he's going to render to every man according to their deeds, how that the wicked will receive justly what they deserve and we will receive good but only on behalf of Christ. Amen. And Paul kind of wraps that thought up with verse number 11. He says, for there is no respect of persons with God. Amen. <clears throat> so he's and this particular passage referring back to the judgment, that there will be no respect of persons, but we'll see throughout the scriptures, though there's really no respect of persons with God, as it says here. That this respect of person means partiality or favoritism. Right. That God does not have favorites, even, even though some objectors to the doctrine of election would say that God does have favorites. But, he chooses based on his own sovereign will. And he, Amen. Really, it's only because of Christ that we receive any good. Yes. Amen. No, so God does not show favoritism like man often does. Mm -hmm. We, if you think of in the scriptures, a uh, Joseph seemed to be the favorite child, at least of his mother. And his brothers were envious over that. Mm -hmm. But God does not have these favorites like we often do. You know, God really doesn't care about who, we, who you are or where you come from or what your social status is. He doesn't care about your gender identity or your, your wealth or your possessions or your fame or or your lack of those things. None of those things give us any standing before God. And a man likes to think that he is going to be a good enough person, or a man likes to think that he is going to, his position will earn him favor before God, but when Paul says there is no respect of persons, he means that there is no thing that we can do to earn favor before God. Amen. So not, not, not the pastor or Sunday school teacher or song leader or being a good church member and all those things will either will earn us his favor before God. <clears throat> so there is nothing that we can do in and of ourselves. So when he says there is no respect of persons with God, I think sometimes it may be a little bit hard for us to grass because we think we can do something to earn his favor but that there really is nothing that we can do amen you know i could probably be real nice to brother larry or buy him some presents he might earn his favor <laughs> but we can't do such things with god can we, we can't. amen Certainly he is pleased when we serve him, and certainly he's pleased when we follow his commands, but we're not earning any extra favor. Not, you know, contrary to what the Catholics and other denominations teach, we can't do something to get more grace in and of ourselves. Amen. And we can't take of the sacraments, and he gives more grace because of that. I mean, we can't pray a certain prayer and then expect him to give us grace because of that. Well, God gives grace as he pleases. Really, to earn grace would be to make it not grace at all. Let's turn over to Colossians chapter 3 and we'll see this same thought here in the book of Colossians. 
Colossians chapter 3, verses 23 and 25. familiar with some of these scriptures in chapter 3 where he tells us to speak those things which are above in the beginning of the chapter. He tells us to be wise and with your husbands, and husbands love your wives, children obey your parents. And then he gets down to verse 22 and tells us the servants to obey the masters in the flesh. <clears throat> in verse 23 he says, And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Amen. Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance for ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. Once again we see that man is going to receive the do he calls it here shall he receive for the wrong which he hath done, or he will receive that which he is deserving for his evil. Right. It's not going to be based on any merit within us. Amen. And just the same, when we receive good, or as he says here in verse 24, the reward of the inheritance, it will be on the merit of Christ, not on our own merit. Certainly, men such as you know, Hitler and Stalin and you know, Genghis Khan and others, we think of very wicked men throughout history, they will stand condemned before God, but yet right. it will be because of their own wickedness, not because yeah. they were, you know, they will not receive a lesser or greater punishment because they were who they are. With the Jews, they will not receive a, a lesser punishment because they are the Jews, neither shall we as Americans receive any lesser punishment because we're Americans. It seems to be a, a fault among Americans to think that we have some prestige among about us. But in the sight of God, it doesn't matter with, Amen. if we're American or whether we're from the, the Philippines or some You're right. little unknown island nation somewhere. If we're from the tribe down in the Sahara somewhere, it doesn't really make a difference when we stand before God. It's mad. Do you know Christ or not? You can be sure none of those none of those things are going to earn you favor with God if you're outside of Christ. Romans 9 seems to put it very plainly as well that there is no respect of persons with God. We can, We'll turn there and read a couple of verses. Romans 9, verses 15 through 18. I believe that one of the reasons there is no respect of person is God because he is sovereign and he does as he pleases. Amen. Romans 9, verse 15. You know, after making the argument, if you will, about Jacob and Esau, how Jacob was loved and Esau was hated, it says in verse 15, For he saith to Moses, this is found in Exodus 33, 19, when he was requested to see the glory of God. He also said this in that passage, he said, For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Then, see God didn't say he will have mercy on certain ones if they do a certain thing or if there are certain people or if there are a certain character or anything like that, does he? Hmm. Rather, who he, whom he will he has mercy on, whom he will he has compassion on. Verse 16 says, So then it is not of him that will it, or of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Amen. A man can, cannot will the mercy or the grace of God. That's right. You know, that's contrary to Armenian type of teaching that man can just desire it but without getting on another rabbit trail. God, man is not going to desire it left to himself. You're right. Amen. 
In John chapter 1, he says that we were born not of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but the will of God. Amen. No, it's not of us that work, nor of us that even, no desire within us, nor work within us that we can earn the mercy of God, but it's this will of God that showeth mercy. And once again, it's according to his own good will and pleasure. Verse number 17 says, For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, and this is in Exodus 9 16, that even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show, the, show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the years. And even a powerful, wicked man such as Pharaoh was under the control of God. Amen. That God was the one who raised him up and put him in power for his purpose. Verse 18 says, Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and on whom he will he hardened it. There you go. Yeah. Well, we like to leave all that last part sometimes, but God can harden the heart just the same as he can soften the heart. You're right. Amen. He can have mercy and grace, and he can withhold mercy and grace. Mm -hmm. And because he is God, it is completely within his ability and character to do so. Amen. So we should be a merciful people. We should be a gracious people. We should be a forgiving people. But God can give mercy as he pleases, and he can withhold that mercy as he pleases, and he will still be a just God either which way. Amen. So people think sometimes God is being cruel or unfair, but really... If he just let all his wrath go right now and destroyed everything, he would still be very much just and we would be deserving. Amen. You're right. So it's not, when we stand before God with any favor at all, it won't be on our marriage, it will be on the marriage of Christ. It will be because God, in his own pleasure, sought to bestow that favor upon us. So grace, by definition, is unmerited favor. That means there is nothing in us that we can do to merit it, to deserve it, to earn it. You know, I know we all know Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are you saved through faith and not of ourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But it goes beyond just salvation and really any favor at all. It is by the grace of God. Amen. Well, let's turn over to Ephesians chapter 1. And only the first 12 verses here will just... Make some comments as we read on through here. Ephesians 1, beginning in verse number 1. See, really throughout each verse, it's all of God. Paul begins with Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and the saints which are of Ephesus, and of the faithful in Christ Jesus. Amen. You see here, Paul. Immediately, he says that he's an apostle only by the will of God. It wasn't by his own choosing or his own right. desires, but the will of God made him an apostle of the Gentiles. I think we're all familiar with the story of when Paul was saved, how he was on his way to persecute God's people, and the Lord struck him down and blinded him temporarily and saved him. And well, he immediately called him to be an apostle of the Gentiles. Amen. See, Paul wasn't looking for God, but God was looking for him. Right. Amen. Verse 2, he goes on to say, Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. And here we see in verse 2 that grace comes from the Father and from Christ. Grace cannot come from within man. Otherwise, like I could have mentioned already, it would not be of grace. It was something we could do. Right. We'll get to later in the book of Romans. It has to either be all the works or all the grace. It can't be one of the, or it has to be one or the other. It can't be a mixture of both. Amen. You're right. Verse number three he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Here we see that. Our blessings are because we are in Christ. Bless 
He has blessed us in Christ, he says in there, verse 3, that really on the behalf of Christ that we receive any blessings at all. Verse number 4, he goes on to say, According as he hath chosen us and him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before him in love. Amen. So it was God that chose us before the world even began, before we had even been born, before we had had good or evil. You know, I, I don't know if I can fully agree with Spurgeon, but I, he once said, I know God had chosen me before I was born, or else he would never chose me at all. Right. Amen. You know, my man's logic, God would not should not have chosen really any of us, uh, that we were all wicked, that we were all sinners, that we were all had transgressed his law. Amen. We had, once again, by his own good pleasure and will, he chose his own before the foundation of the world. Verse number five, he goes on to say, having predestinated us in the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Amen. It wasn't that God looked down through eternity and saw who would believe or who would be good or anything like that. Rather, it says he predestinated us because according to the good pleasure of his will. And there you go. Amen. The good pleasure means that <coughs> according to his choice, according to what pleased him. It was by his own good will and pleasure that he chose those that he chose. Again, the opponents to the doctrines of grace often say that we think we're privileged or we're special or that we are proudful, and sometimes we can be, but grace should never make us proud. It should make us very humble people because that God wouldn't show us any favor, any grace, any mercy. <coughs> It's really, I don't like to say it, it's more than we <laughs> deserve, it's more than we could ever have, it's more than we could ever do in ourselves. It's more than we are worthy of, that's for sure. You're right, amen. That he would be pleased in his own purpose and plan and purpose to choose any that had transgressed his law was the great display of his grace and mercy. Verse number six, he goes on to say, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Amen. Here we see it's once again by his grace, but also that he is the one who makes us accepted in the beloved. It's not us that makes ourselves accepted. It's not that we have to become a good enough person, or we have to do this or do that. But really through His grace, He makes us accepted in Christ. Amen. Verse number seven, He goes on to say, in whom, as in Christ, we have redemption through His blood and, for the, and the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Again, it's in Christ, and it's through His blood, and it's according to His grace that we receive any of these things. We get it's redemption. And God did not, was not required to forgive any. Amen. He was not required to redeem any. We get, as we have already saw, it was according to His good will and pleasure that He did. Amen. Well, God could. Would have been just if he destroyed Adam and Eve in the garden. He would have been just to wipe out all of his creation at that point. Or in Noah's day, he would have been just to destroy the whole earth and start all over completely again. Right. But even in that, we see Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Amen. And he could have done like Sodom and Gomorrah and just destroyed everything. Nothing to ever live there again. And so it is, even today, that redemption, forgiveness of sin, salvation, as we would call it, is only according to His grace. Mm -hmm. Verse number eight, he goes on to say, 
wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, as according to his grace once again, that he has abounded that grace towards us, he has overflowed it towards us, that we have abundant grace is once again all the hand of God. Mm -hmm. Verse number nine, he goes on to say, having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself. Amen. Again, that he would even reveal himself or any truth to us as the good, according to the good pleasure of his will. Right. According to his plan and purpose. You know, I think of the Samaritan woman at the well. Christ didn't by accident end up at the well at the same time as she did. Christ didn't just happen to know that she had had five husbands and the one she was with then was not her husband. Right. No, all of that was according to the purpose and plan of God. But Christ knew very well that she would come by at that particular time. And Amen. That's why he said, I must needs go through Samaria. Right. To the fact that he brought about all the things he had to bring about our salvation is just really reinforces that it's according to his purpose and plan. If it hadn't been for godly grandparents, I would have probably never went to church on my own. But yet, the Lord pleased to place them, my grandfather and dad. And then eventually he would burn my heart to go and uh, send uh, this old country preacher named Lord Gordon Downs to preach Amen. the gospel effectively to me. God works all the details out to bring about our salvation. That That's it. It's never by chance that things happen the way they do. Verse number 10, he goes on to say that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Amen. He was gathering together in his Time when we shall be forever with the Lord, it will be because we are in Christ, he says. That he might gather together and one all things in Christ. It's on the merit of Christ that we will be gathered together and spend for spend eternity with our Lord. Amen. As Paul says in Thessalonians, so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's again because we're in Christ not because of anything we did. Verse number 11, he goes on to say, in whom we, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance. And that's in Christ that we have obtained this inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Amen. That verse doesn't prove sovereignty of God, I don't know what else does. Right. That God works all things after the counsel of his own will. They're not just some things, they're not just the major things. He says all things are working according to his will. Right. And when you combine that with Romans 8, 28, that he works all things together for good and love them, them who are the called according to his purpose. Amen. That's great assurance for the child of God. You're right. And certainly Satan is battling against God, you could say it that way. But Satan never has the upper hand. God is still very much in control. Amen. You know, it's not that sometimes the devil's ahead, sometimes God's ahead, sometimes the wicked are ahead, sometimes the righteous are ahead. You know, God is fully sovereign in control and he's not one bit worried about what is going on in this world. Amen. Verse number 12, we'll hear and we'll close. He says that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Here's the culmination of all things, that it's all for God's glory. That's it. Yeah. That we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. And ultimately, that's what our purpose is, to bring glory and honor to him. Amen.
One day we'll stand around the throne and say, Thou art worthy, O Lord, receive glory and honor and power. For thy pleasure, thou hast created all things. Paraphrasing Revelation a little bit, but God created all things for his pleasure, all things bring him glory and honor. And Amen. His salvation, he's given us this ability, if I can say that way, to bring even more glory and honor to him. It's never, it should never be that we seek glory in the things of God. It should never be that. We say, look at us, and look what I have done. We should always be look unto Christ and look what he has done for me. Amen. But it really doesn't matter what you have done. Is with God, there is no respect of persons. That's right. You know, Spurgeon, as great of a preacher as he would, will not be able to stand before God and say, God, look at all things I did for you. That's it. Amen. He himself, would, I think, would testify to that, that it was all of Christ. Or as his book of, title was one book, said it's all of grace. <clears throat> and Jesus Christ died for me. He said it was a sum of his theology. That should really be the theme of our life, the theme of our service for God, is that Christ died for us. So it should never be to point people back to us and what we have done. It's not like Osteen says in The Power of I Am. That's one of his books. <laughs> it's never about us. It's all about bringing glory and honor to Christ. Amen. And because of that, with God, there is no respect of persons. Amen. Because it all ultimately points back to His glory, it's not going to be about what we are or what we have done. It's going to be what Christ has done for us. When we stand before God, we will not be able to claim our own righteousness, our own good deeds, our own works. Whether you're saved or lost is what will ultimately matter. When you Said we're per se, we will not gain favor by the positions we have or the places we live, or the, we will not be more favored in the eyes of God because of what we have done. And at the very most, we'll receive a greater reward that we can cast back at the feet of Christ. Amen. And on the other hand, if we don't know Christ, no, those things are going to gain you any favor, any more mercy when you stand before God. In fact that you're the, the preacher's kid, or whether you, in fact you are the preacher, the fact that you right. went to church every Sunday, every Wednesday, if you don't know Christ, none of those things are going to earn you any favor. Amen. Contrary to what Again, the Catholic Church teaches that there is no purgatory that you can work your way out of. That's it. Well, it's either saved or lost. That will all really be all that matters when we stand before God. Nothing necessarily wrong with doing good and being a good person or going to church regularly. But ultimately, those things aren't what saves an individual. Right. Those aren't the things that earn favor in the sight of God. And God gives his grace as he pleases, and he gives his mercy as he pleases, and he gives his compassion as he pleases, but he also hardens as he pleases. That's it. And with the God, there is no respect to persons. There is no partiality. Yeah. If we can thank God for saved, because that means we will receive great spiritual blessings in Christ. Mm -hmm. Well, you can say, it ought to be a sobering thought that those aren't saved because that means you will receive the full combination of God if you're not in Christ. That's it. And he, uh, going back to Spurgeon once again, but he said something like, <laughs> he didn't spare his own son to die for our sins. So you can be sure he won't spare you, if you're not saved. Amen. 
We're going to go ahead and close with that thought, and we'll pick up again next week. Amen.